Number one, hit the like. Number two, hit the bell. Number three, hit the share. Number four, leave a comment. Thanks. Making a prediction like that is bold, I know, but I've historically done pretty well on predict it, so I think I'll be fine. Donald Trump. I campaigned for him in 2016. I served on students for Trump. I've donated to the campaign, and I was excited to see him take office. I even went to the inauguration in 2017. We all know his presidency has not been perfect, and I've talked at length about good things he's done and things I disagree with, but that isn't the point today. What we didn't know back in 2016, but are slowly starting to come to terms with, is that when we elected Trump in 2016, we may have been electing the last Republican president ever. An overly bold prediction? Perhaps, but it's likely true. And the reason has nothing to do with liberals out-arguing the right, or people becoming convinced in a mass awakening of the truth and virtue of leftist social policy. No, it's primarily a question of who is doing the voting. Add in privatized tech censorship, and you have a recipe for a completely manipulated and controlled election that would make supposed tyrants like Vladimir Putin blush. At this point, Trump is probably going to win in 2020. But what happens in 2024? Unless Tucker Carlson and Ann Coulter team up on a dream ticket, things don't look very good. I don't mean to depress or blackpill you, but we need to be realistic. Today, I'm going to show you not only why I think Trump will be the last Republican president, but why the U.S. is poised to take a lurch far to the left on every issue, from free speech to gun control, in the next five to ten years. And I almost forgot to mention that my newsletter that I write with whatsonpolitics.com will be coming out very soon. In fact, I'm submitting my editorial today, and that will be going out to everyone who has subscribed to my email newsletter in just a few days. If you are not yet subscribed, what are you waiting for? Go to whatsonpolitics.com slash James or click the link down below and sign up for that. It's totally free. There's no catch. And every month you get two of my exclusive columns you cannot find anywhere else sent straight to your email inbox. And you also get my appearance on the What's on Politics podcast sent straight to you as well. It's a great deal. It's really a win-win-win situation. There's no catch. So go ahead and check that out today. I do appreciate it. And it's the best way to stay up to date on what I'm doing. It's a sad thing to be the last of any legacy. The last airbender, the last of us, the last Jedi. Actually, that never should have happened. Being the last Republican president is, I guess, bittersweet. I'm 23, and for the most of my politically aware life, I considered myself to be a Republican, except for a few stints with libertarianism. Your parents were likely Republicans. Your grandparents, too, unless you're from the South. And for many people, the Republican Party and conservatism are part of a shared identity with their family and social circles. At the same time, and I know it's an old talking point, but what have Republicans and conservatives really conserved? Despite Republican legislatures and presidents for most of the 21st century, things like anti-whiteness, the sexualization of children, the creep of the LGBT agenda, and white guilt are stronger now than they have been at any point in American history. We've gotten tax cuts, I guess, and have some better gun laws at the state level. That's about it. The Republican Party has largely failed to protect the interests of its core constituents. We're talking about this topic today thanks to James over on Subscribestar, who recommended I talk about changing demographics and how that will impact the U.S. going forward. Reminder, you can have a say in what I talk about by pledging just five bucks a month over on Subscribestar. It's only with your support that I can keep making videos, so I genuinely do thank you all for your support. Demographics are a good starting point for understanding why Democrats are on the precipice of permanent control of the executive branch. As you know, the U.S. elects presidents based on the Electoral College. Trump garnered 306 electoral votes in 2016, 36 more than the 270 necessary to win. That fate could easily be reversed, though, by flipping just one state. Flip two states and it's really over. Not two states like Idaho and Utah. I love you, Idaho, and I love being your neighbor, but you're not that electorally important. The focus here is the honky-tonk capital of the American Southwest, that is, of course, Texas. If Texas had, somehow, been a blue state in 2016, Democrats would have cruised to victory with a cool 270 electoral votes to Republicans 268. The race literally came down to one state. The thing is, it wasn't really in play in 2016. That is going to change. Ah, but it's Texas, you say. The Republicans' answer to the Democrats' California stronghold. It's never going blue. Well, strictly speaking, it's already trending that way. In this handy graph I've created, thank you 8th grade math, you see the share of the vote given to the Democrat and Republican in each presidential election since the year 2000. In said handy chart, with a trend line, you see the Republican share gradually decreasing and the Democrat share increasing. 
Based on these trends alone, let's extrapolate out a few years. When we do, you see that Texas is projected to become a blue state by the year 2028. I would argue it would happen even sooner than that. And to do so, let's look at why Texas is becoming bluer each election cycle. From Newsweek.com, quote, At the time of the 2010 census, Hispanic residents accounted for around 38.2% of Texas's total population, while white residents made up 46.2%. As of 2018, the former had increased to 40.4%, while the latter dropped to 42.3%. The state's black and Asian populations also grew in that time period, now accounting for 12.2 and 5.1 percent, respectively. At the current growth rate, Hispanic residents could lead the Texas population by 2022, the report stated. The growth of the Hispanic community has been statewide, but 47 percent reside in the state's most populated counties of Harris, Dallas, Tarrant, Bexar, and Travis. A shift in demographics could lead to more contention in redistricting, as Republicans want to keep the state red, while others see Texas turning shades of purple and possibly back to blue. In 2016, former Democratic Congressman Beto O'Rourke lost his bid to unseat incumbent Republican Senator Texas Cruz by a relatively narrow margin of 2.56 2.56 percentage points, leading some to believe a Democrat could indeed soon win a statewide election in Texas. And quote, there goes Newsweek advancing the crazy white supremacist conspiracy theory that demographics have some impact on electoral results. Somebody please ban them from Instagram and Facebook so they can't spread their conspiracies. Yes, it's true that Texas Latinos tend to be more conservative than the national average. That's how Texas and California can have basically the same demographics, yet Texas is a red state and California is is quite the opposite. With an increasing Latino birth rate, falling white birth rate, and baby boomer deaths increasing by the day, 2024 is going to be a toss-up. My model above shows the 2024 election as within two percentage points, and that's without taking into account the exponential rate of demographic shift. We don't have time for full breakdowns on every state, but quickly, let's touch on Arizona and Florida. Using the model I used above to project Texas, Arizona appears safe for a long time, but when you factor in exponentially increasing baby boomer deaths, things will flip sooner. And by the way, the races are so tight, they're within one percentage point for several years. And Florida, this model shows blue by 2020. And now with felons being able to vote in Florida and thousands of Puerto Rican migrants having moved to Florida and planning to stay there, all of whom can vote in the presidential election, things are not looking great there in 2020 and beyond. Oh, and how do demographics relate to voting, by the way? I brushed past that because I figured everybody knows by now, so my bad. As we see from every survey, exit poll, and piece of research, white Americans are the only demographic that, by and large, votes Republican. Hispanics, Asians, African Americans, all others vote overwhelmingly Democrat. It's more than just party ID, though. Changing American demographics are leading to a changing American idea about traditional Western concepts like freedom of speech and the right to bear arms for one's defense. Here's where I show the Cato survey I've shown a million times, right? Well, yeah, actually. A report from the Cato Institute titled The State of Free Speech and Tolerance in America found that young people believe the time for arguments is over and the time for illiberalism has come. Unfortunately, not a cool kind of illiberalism, more like an anti-white, totalitarian, global, gay, corporate police state. Among other choice findings, like 51% of liberals saying it's morally acceptable to punch Nazis, 51% of Democrats saying it should be illegal to misgender someone, and 58% of Democrats saying employers should punish employees for offensive Facebook posts, Cato found some interesting things about speech and race. Strong majorities of blacks and Hispanics agreed with the following statements, quote, people who don't respect others don't deserve the right of free speech. Hate speech is an act of violence, and our society can prohibit hate speech and still protect free speech. This concept of freedom doesn't seem to be registering properly. And this isn't purely a racial divide, with nearly half of white people agreeing with the sentiment that we can prohibit hate speech while protecting free speech, which is a totally moronic thing to believe on its face. I know there are plenty of minorities that believe in free speech, many watching this video, and plenty of white liberals that hate the idea of free speech, many watching and flagging this video. But when dealing with populations of millions of people, data like this is very informative and allows us to prognosticate about certain trends in society. The Cato study went on to find that Latinos, African Americans, women, Democrats, and college students are the most supportive of hate speech laws. What we can learn from this Cato survey 
and from the data from Pew Research that shows whites are the only racial group that says protecting the right to own a gun is more important than gun control, is that as the country becomes less white and more (laughs) diverse, the American people's attitudes will change to become less interested in free speech, hungrier for things like outlawing of hate speech, which really means outlawing white people expressing political ideas, and more primed for things like gun regulations and confiscations. Again, it's important to note that this is not because liberals and the left are winning the argument. It's because they're changing the ears of people hearing their arguments, bringing in people that are more amicable to their ideas. Unless Republicans are going to totally capitulate and attempt to run on, I don't know, arrest white people for hate speech and confiscate guns platform, which, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised to see from some Republicans, there's simply no way they'll be able to adjust to the new electorate come 2024 and beyond. The topic of speech brings me to my third and final point. Donald Trump is going to be the last Republican president, partially by virtue of the fact that the internet public square has become impassable to all but the most ardent neoliberals. In 2016, you had people like Milo, Gavin McInnes, Alex Jones, and countless others generating buzz and excitement and passion behind the Trump campaign. Three years later, Milo is on Telegram, Gavin McInnes is drinking himself further into depression, and Alex Jones is, well, I don't even know three huge pro-Trump media celebrities, muzzled and destroyed by big tech censorship. Even if they wanted to campaign for Trump or another Republican in 2024, they couldn't. Their tongues have been ripped out. Frankly, why would they even want to campaign for Trump? He's done nothing to defend Americans' right to participate in public discourse. Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube are the modern public square. And as long as these companies want to take advantage of internet infrastructure developed by the U.S. federal government and subsidized via the Telecommunications Act, they should have no right to muzzle or deplatform peaceful legal speech. Hell, just this week, I got the boot from Instagram and Facebook, despite not posting on my Facebook page in months, not posting on my personal profile in nearly two months, and only using my Instagram to post non-political pictures of me doing cool things with friends and family. And YouTube is actively suppressing this channel. I'm nearly entirely banned from recommended videos. People report being suspiciously unsubscribed from my channel. And despite having a better up-to-downvote ratio than ever before, I've suspiciously lost thousands of subs in the last month. Clearly, it isn't my content that's the issue. It's more popular than ever with the viewers. It's YouTube's active suppression. Next time around, in 2020 or 2024, who's going to be out there to campaign for the right? System-approved guys like Charlie Kirk or whatever, but beyond that? Trump would not have won the primary and general election if it were not for alternative media. The GOP establishment, understandably from their perspective, does not want that type of insurgency to happen again in 2024 on behalf of a Tucker or Coulter candidacy. That's why they're sitting there doing nothing about censorship. It's in their best interest to get their party back under control. But ironically, a Tucker or a Coulter, an identitarian unafraid to confront the elites truly responsible for the destruction and hollowing out of this country, would be their only chance of winning in 2024, generating massive excitement in the country's white working class voter base, which should be the base of the Republican Party. But a Mitt Romney, a Dan Crenshaw, nobody's going to show up for a gun-grabbing open borders dweeb. The GOP's candidates are too repulsive to stand a chance. Consider the three elements we talked about today. Changing demographics in swing states. Leftist ideas being more widespread as white baby boomers die and are replaced with young minorities eager to censor free speech and confiscate guns. And the total censorship of legitimate alternative media. 2020 is going to be a wild campaign season, no doubt. But for me, it will be accompanied with the knowledge that this is probably the last one we will ever see the GOP win. (music) 